Hello everyone, today is March 31st, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week's week in charts is brought to you once again by me, and more specifically, my trading service. I made this graphic, obviously, uh, end of last year, early this year, and so far it's, uh, it's, been, it's been pretty true. It's been pretty bumpy out there but so far so good as far as uh performance and stuff and we'll take a look at that in just one second or towards the end of the show i should say there's a disclaimer screen as you know you could lose money trading uh you could read all the disclaimers on my website if you're really really bored and i like to sum it up by saying all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then so what are we going to talk about well this is a week where i think it's time to get back on to the charts. And we're going to touch upon some trading psychology and some money and position management, portfolio management, all those other good things based on your questions and developing in advance. But I think now's the time to cover a few things that are very important based on this um, market. So specifically, I want to talk initially about V-shaped recoveries. Now, there's two types of V-shaped recoveries. Obviously, you could have one at low levels, and then obviously you could have one at high levels like we have now. So let's talk about what's going on when it happens at low levels. So if we go back to 2009, obviously the market kind of meandered for quite a while. This is a weekly chart, by the way, S&P 500. And then we begin to sell off, and then that sell off accelerated, and then we had this one last thrust lower. And then afterwards, we had this V-shaped recovery. But this was from low levels. This was from, I think, 13-year lows, if memory serve, serves. So that's a pretty significant low for a market to be making. So when a market is down at such, such low levels, one question that you need to ask yourself is, who's left to sell? And that's one thing I've been thinking a lot about lately, and I'm going to touch upon this later on. But I started working on a beginner's course. And one thing that's kind of interesting in doing that, it just makes me realize how important it is to discuss the fact that there are people behind these bars. It's not just uh, magical little squiggles on a chart. This is actual trading that has happened. So when a market loses 50% of its value, one has to wonder who's left to sell because a lot of people will be forced out long before then. And then one thing to think about, and I thought about this right before the show, is some may be still fighting the last war. So maybe way down here, you've got some shorts that think this thing is going to go to zero the zombie apocalypse will start tomorrow. Let's just keep shorting like crazy. So not only is the market sold out from all of those who have to sell, but maybe it's also oversold, not, not from a classical technical analysis standpoint, but oversold from the standpoint of there's additional selling from the shorts. Now remember, always remember with shorts, Anytime somebody shorts a market, unless it goes to zero, of course, they have to buy it back at some point. So any shorts that are out there are potential pent-up buying. So always kind of keep that in the back of your head. So when a V-shaped recovery happens at low levels, there's a pretty good chance that it might be a major reversal and the works. And then obviously in 2009 it was, and it was really beautiful rally since. Dave, would you have a market with significant overhead supply that is very close and we now have, and we know, and we now, or you restrained as we have now, or you're restrained in buying new longs? We're going to get to that. That's a good question though. You're reading ahead. So a V-shaped recovery at a low level is a good thing. Or any type of emerging trend from a low level is a good thing. In fact, with my emerging trend patterns, as we'll see in the next slide, again, I'm getting maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, 
I like to see them coming off of major, major, major lows or major, major, major highs. So I also use the name interchangeably trend transition. So what trend are you transitioning from? A longer term downtrend to an uptrend or a longer term uptrend to a downtrend? And for that to happen, ideally, you want to see that coming off of major, major, major lows. And we'll take a look at a signal here in the S&P 500. Now, here's a weekly S&P 500. And obviously, you could, if you do this chart going way back to 2009, this is a long, 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 long uptrend. And now there's a couple things going on I've been talking about quite a bit. Uh, on a net-net basis, we're about where we were way back in 2014. So the market hadn't made a whole lot of forward progress. Shorter term, though, it's really done well. It's going pretty much straight up. It's made a V-shaped recovery at very high levels. Now, a couple things happen when you have a V-shaped recovery at high levels some people might be looking to get off the hook okay so let's say somebody bought the market a long time ago maybe some institutions bought it a long time ago and they've been riding it for a long long time so they might be inclined to want to get out of their position so that could be some pent-up selling now, who else might be looking to get off the hook? Well, the Johnny come lately. I've been telling the story recently. One of my wife's friends called me in a bit of a panic. I just started uh, investing last year, and uh, we're already down a bunch of money. And the, the manager, uh, and I use that term loosely, uh, the salesman, I should say, uh, put us in a bunch of funds that have like really big loads. So in addition to the 10%, the market has dropped. We're down another 5%. So now we're down 50%. And we're just getting started. This is frustrating. So those people who are late to the game, meaning that they got in late last year or even in 2014, late in 2014, as opposed to that V-shaped recovery back in 2009, they're, getting, they're a little late to the game. Again, not to be redundant. And you got to realize that the new money is the fast money, okay? So they finally throw in a towel because the market, you know, 2009, 2010, 2011, oh, we had some bumpy years in here. But for the most part, the market has done this since 2000 and died. Well, finally, they reach a point right here where they can't stand it anymore. So they throw in a towel. Well, they do, they buy, okay? They're the last to buy. But then what happens when the market begins to sell off, they are also the first to throw in the towel. Now, they might hold on through this slide, but when they get back to break even, they might be tempted to get out at break even. And that's one of the questions that Don's asking. What about the overhead supply? The other thing that I often talk about is it's hard to run a race right after you have ran a race. So when a market rallies up like this, it goes kind of straight up for several weeks, it's kind of hard for it to continue to do that. So let's say you're at high levels, you sell off hard. It's hard to mount a new leg on top of an old leg, especially when you have a longer term trend behind you where you could have some, some people who might be looking to get off longer term. But without getting too far into this and debating all that, just know that if a market is overbought, it overbought just means that it's ran up quite a bit over a short period of time. It's hard for it to continue to do that. And then when you add that in with all these other thoughts, it's going to be hard for a market to continue to go higher. Now, a market can do whatever it wants to do, okay? But it is important to think about the players, again, the people behind the bars. And I think that as we get further and further down this 
market analysis and trading curve and, and however you want to look at it, especially those who get so focused in something like a that's a very arcane type of methodology. And I don't want to pick on these people too much because to each his own. If they're successful with it, that's fine. But I think that if someone is is following some sort of bar count or wave count or uh, numerology or something, they might forget that there's actually still people that are making these trades that are that are buying and selling the markets. So again, it's not just squiggles. Think about the players. Again, who's left to buy? Who may have bought late in the game? Who's been in the game longer term? Now, what's the most obvious thing for this market to do in the most unobvious manner? Well, to me, it looks like it's been rolling over for a long time. So the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner would be for it to continue to roll over but have a big rally first. And I borrowed this from, from Linda Rasky, the most obvious thing in an obvious manner and also the most pain thing. I've heard the most pain thing over the years, but in more recent times I've heard Linda talk about it and I gave her credit for these. I asked, I asked her where they came from and she just said, oh, those are florisms. I don't, I don't claim to have invented that, but I'll give her credit because that's where I learned it from especially this most obvious thing. So let's say you got a market that looks like it's really rolling over. What's going to happen first? A lot of times it'll have a big retrace rally and then roll over. Now, the worst thing that could happen, and again, we'll know it when we see it. We're day-by-day -day guys. We're not going to try to predict this. But the worst thing could happen is the market does this, like the peas did, and we got some meandering around, whatever. Sell it off. And it has one last shoot-up or shot whatever you want to call it, shoot up, <laughs> shot to do highs, and then rolls over. Because that would cause the most paid to the most amount of people, okay? And you always have to think about this because a market is pretty good at causing a lot of pain to a lot of people. Don't believe me, just trade for a while, <laughs> you know? Uh, so... And we're not going to be pretty good at doing that. So that would be the worst case scenario. I don't know if that's going to happen, obviously. But we'll know it when we see it. Like, uh, what's his name? Potter Stewart. So we do have a major sell signal that's still in place. Now, as I've said before, when it comes to something like a bow tie off of all-time highs and – Go back and look at history, bonds, the euro. I mean, I could go on and on. Almost every market in history, after an all-time high, that bow tie sort of set the stage for that move lower, and that top remained in place until and unless that old high got taken out. So in other words, we have an all-time high here. And I've talked about this quite a bit. So if you go back and watch the weekend charts, you'll see the archives. You'll see that I bring this concept up quite a bit. And it's really freaking amazing when you go back again and you look at bonds and gold and just pick a market that made a top over the last 100 years or so, okay? So a bow tie or some other sort of tra transitional signal that I follow, such as a first thrust or even uh, a gatekeeper or something like that, that top remains in place until and unless the market goes on to make new highs. Now, this is a major signal, major meaning that it's coming off of all-time highs or at least multi-year highs or multi-year lows. We just talked about the bottom in the S&P 500 in 2009. Well, after we see some transitional signals on a daily chart, a weekly chart, and then above, we know – that that bottom remains in place until and unless the market goes on to make new lows. Until it starts making 13-year-plus lows, we have to treat that bottom as a bottom remains in place. Right now, we have to treat the top in the S&P because we have a signal as a top in the S&P until and unless the old highs can take it out. Now, this does not mean it's going to be a route lower. I mean, look at this. It's been all over the place, okay? And it doesn't mean that you can say, oh, well, we got this major sell signal. I'm short to the gills, and I can hold on forever. 
until at least, or at least I can hold on until it, it goes on to make new highs. Well, you might not have that much staying power to be able to do that. Plus, I don't know if you would even want to. But the thing is, when you have a, a signal like this, you want to be skeptical and maybe err on the side of the possibility that the market could be rolling over. And I'm going to flesh that out in quite a bit of detail in a minute, too. So, again, it doesn't mean to throw caution to the wind. It means that you need to be skeptical until and unless. Also, one point I want to bring up, and I don't know if I have a specific slide on this, but I often get asked, hey, Dave, you know, what about between here and there? Well, so what? There's no need to rush out and get buy a bunch of stocks. Take a show me approach. Let the market prove itself by going on to make new highs and staying there before getting really excited and jumping in. Now, when I say jump in, I just mean like jump in with both feet. We, we do listen to the database, and I'm getting a little further ahead of myself than I want to, but we do listen to the database and do what it's telling us to do. And I'll talk about that in one second. But it's okay, even if you're way down here and you're bearish, it's okay to let that market retrace and not run out and buy a bunch of stocks until and unless it starts making new highs. Now, once it gets way, way down here, or I should say, if it gets way, way down here, like it did in 2009, we're obviously not going to wait for all-time highs before getting back in. Then we start paying attention to that new transitional setup, that new emerging trend, and maybe that is a major emerging trend in place. And so we follow that. But as long as you're fairly close to the old highs, you respect that sell signal until and unless the market goes on to make new highs. Now, one thing that you need to think about when it comes to a market is you always want to look under the hood. Now, I do this by first looking at a couple thousand stocks every day and then maybe another thousand of that subset by going through my loosely based scan. So I just kind of want to get a feel for everything that's going on. I do that super quickly. Slow down a little bit when I look for my pullbacks. Okay. And then maybe slow down even further when I get to that, that call list. Right now, I've got about a hundred and something stocks that are in my, in what I would call my call list. I don't know for lack of a better word. And then I will let down to my landry list, which are the stocks that I'm going to be focusing on or the next day or soon or there are at least stocks from a certain area to keep my attention in that area so to keep them on the radar so to speak now after i do all that now before well after i do all that i have a pretty good feel for what's really going on in the market because i'll see stocks that do highs i'll see emerging trends i'll see a lot of things happen I do what would be considered a top-down approach. I take a top-down approach to the markets, but I do it in kind of a bottom-up fashion by starting with the stocks and then looking at the sectors and then finally doing my index analysis. So once I get to the sectors, the question I ask myself, even though I already have a pretty good feel for what's going on, is what's driving this market? And recently, we had utilities making new highs. And then we also had real estate making new highs. Now, these areas are interest rate sensitive. Now, rates have been low forever. So as trend followers, we can't say, oh, that's going to end tomorrow. But we do know the, top, the, the clock is ticking. We can't have low rates forever. Okay. So... It's a little dangerous to play these, these areas. Also, these areas tend to be a little bit lower in volatility. Something bad could still happen, but in general, the volatility is low, so you're going to have to sit in them longer to try to get a, a, a nice move out. The other thing that's kind of interesting is food and beverages making new highs. So this could be considered a defensive area. Also, utilities are still considered a defensive area, too. I don't know so much about real estate, but real estate's obviously interest rate sensitive. Now, what else is 
make a new highs. Well, you got food and beverage, make a new highs. Well, if you eat, what comes after that? Well, you'll need toilet paper. So toilet paper, or in this case, it's consumer non-durables, but you get the idea. So that's another defensive area. So in a bear market, people still eat and poop, you know, <laughs> to put it mildly. So these are some of the major areas that are driving the market higher. What's also kind of interesting, on a transitional basis, when we get to the portfolio, you'll see we're long metals and mining and we're long energies. So it's like these commodity stocks are really doing well. So the question you have to ask yourself is – is or i should say what's what's driving this market and can you build a bull market on those areas can you build a bull market on defensive related issues and commodities i don't know okay but i'd much rather build a bull market on something a little bit more exciting like technology and and health services and drugs and in some of these other areas and much broader areas in general, they're just these selected areas that we're seeing at this moment. Now, retail is also doing OK. So that's that's another positive. Now, when you look at it, all this, you got to you got to add in the positives. All the only problem with retail is it's a bit of a of a V-shaped recovery at high levels like everything else. In fact, it's kind of the poster child for V-shaped recoveries. Retail kind of looks like this. So. Again, I just think it's going to be hard for retail to mount a leg on top of a no leg. Now, it doesn't matter what I think. The market can do whatever it wants. I'm just being prudent. And also, keep in mind that being prudent does not mean that I'm being obstinate. Okay? I think in markets, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is is. And, and it takes you a long time. Once you... Once you think you got markets figured out, then you have to sort of undo that and, and get back to the beginning, as we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But it's like you have to kind of like lose that ego that you acquire with experience. And they just say, well, what is, is. So, again, what is, is. So deep down, we're still trend following morons. So if this market goes to make new highs and stays there, okay, and stays there is a key phrase in that sentence, then what are we going to do? Well, we're trend followers, okay? Like Leo Melamed said once, he's a former chairman of the Chicago Merck. Do a Google on him. There's a couple of good articles uh, out there. Uh, his book is Melamed on the Markets. I don't remember a lot in that book being uh, influential on me other than he said, be a lover, not a fighter, be a lover of trends. And that really stuck with me. And that's something if you've become to these shows for a while, you know, I repeat him quite often. And the other thing is we will trade when we feel that the odds are stacked in our favor. So. If you're trying to buy a market that's just trying to get out of a range and trying to make to new highs and like Don's pointing out, has a bunch of overhead supply, maybe that's not the best time to buy a market, okay? So you always ask yourself, WWJD, what would Jimmy do? And again, I'm going to have to find some new quotes, but boy, there's such great quotes from people like Melamed and Rogers and people who, who have been around for a long time. And as Jimmy Rogers once said, I wait until there's money lying in the corner, and all I have to do is walk over and pick it up. In the meantime, I do nothing. And that was, I think, in the first Market Wizards. So... Being prudent doesn't mean being obstinate. What is, is. But just make sure that you believe that the odds are stacked in your favor. One thing that I wrote about, and I didn't have time to incorporate into this presentation, but I wrote about recently, it's like if I was going to have a protege, if I was going to have somebody to come along and, and 
I could retire and they could just do what I do. I would much rather somebody who's patient than smart. And this is a market that really tests your patience or, or more than – it always tests your patience, but more than normal, it seems like that's the type of market that we're in. Now, again, being prudent does not mean being obstinate. And the beauty of once you have a methodology – and once you follow the methodology and, and, of course, embrace it, then you could think and talk and analyze and scrutinize until you blew in the face the, the overall market and what's happening. But the bottom line is, if you're following the process, then stops are going to take you out when you're wrong or no longer right. So we had several shorts coming into this year or we put on early this year. I forget exactly when they went on. I could look at the, the trades, but we have one left, okay, out of several of the shorts. So when that happens, you just say so long, thanks for all the fish. So you might still be bearish or feel bearish, but if the stop takes you out, then what do you do? Well, you get out of the position. And the other thing is being selective. What would Jimmy do? And waiting for entries will often keep you out of new trouble. We had some shorts not too long ago that didn't trade. No trigger, no trade. Okay. And even on the long side recently, we had some longs that didn't trigger. There were a few of them. Quite a few. And it always amazes me how many losing trades you could avoid simply by waiting for an entry. You could stay out of a lot of trouble by waiting for an entry. Now, it's hard to quantify that because your account stays the same. But trust me, if you take trades that don't trigger – more often than not, you're probably going to end up with a loser. And if you end up with a loser, now you got to climb out the hole on your next winner. So, so it makes it harder to get down the line. Sometimes not trading is the best thing to do. And sometimes an entry, waiting for an entry, will keep you out of those next trades. And I'm amazed at how many stocks don't trigger and then turn out to be really big stinkers. And as I said a thousand times, I get emails from people, Dave, I'm next XYZ, what do I do? It's like, why'd you buy that stock? You told me to. What did I tell you to? Six months ago. I'm going to go back and look some six months. Yep, there it is right there. I recommended it, but it never triggered. Well, why'd you get in? Well, I thought I'd beat the system. Well, stop doing that, you know? So no trigger, no trade. Being prudent does not mean being obstinate. Now, what you need to do is let the database speak and listen to what it's saying. This is something I talk about over and over again. So what happened? We saw a bunch of shorts. We took quite a few of them. Some of them triggered. Some of them didn't. The ones that we took obviously triggered. And what are we seeing now and in more recent times? We haven't seen any shorts in a while. So we don't have to get the whole market figured out and get the up or down correct. By the way, it's a lot harder to predict an overall market than it is to predict an individual stock, okay? But you have to have a general framework and a general mindset. Like right now, we know that the market is sideways at best, still a little questionable. Shorter term, it has gone up. But we don't have to figure that all out, at least not today. All we have to do is listen to the database. And the database has not produced any shorts in a while. And also the process, following the process, the money management has taken us out of some shorts at profits. Now, we had to give up some open profits on some of these longs, but we still – of shorts, I mean. But we still made money on them. And then people, I still get emails from people, Dave, why do we give up so much money? It's like, well, if that stresses you out, just send me the money you made. Dave Landry at uh, Cynthia Trading LLC, P.O. Box 298, Abita Springs, Louisiana, 70420. 
And in the last 15 years, I've yet to receive any cash in my box. So follow the process, even though the process means you have to give up some open gains. Follow the process, even though you might be stopped out of the loss. Follow the process, even though you might not get any new trades by waiting for an entry. Follow the process, even though it might mean that the database is not producing any setups. I have, I was going to tease you in a minute and show you the portfolio, and I've got the, the positions for today, potential positions for today blacked out. But there are no official recommendations for today. I have some stocks that I'm watching on my Landry list. But today is a day where you're paying me to tell you not to do anything. And, and, and let me tell you something. If you could not, if you could learn to not do anything when there's nothing to do, like my buddy Jimmy says, then you'll do quite fine. So you need to listen to the database and do what it's telling you to do. Now, the question is, what have you done for me lately? Well, let's take a peek at the portfolio. Great questions coming in. We'll get to those in one second. And then uh, hold off on your stock picks just for a few minutes uh, until we get to the actual charts. So this is the open portfolio. And like I said, we have one little lonely chart left. This OZRK, it's a bank. The banks look like they were just going to absolutely implode a while back. And they did to some extent. And now they're kind of bouncing around. So some of these open profits are being given up, but that's okay. Okay. It's all part of the process. Again, you want to follow the process. I'm not going to get into details on how to read the portfolio. We've done that ad nauseum. But I do want to point out one thing. If a line is highlighted, then it means that that position is still open. If a line is not highlighted, it means that that position has come off. Okay. Now, when the position comes totally off, it gets moved to the historical records and it's no longer obviously in the open portfolio. But the reason I'm pointing this out is in this case, it was 500 shares based on a 100K account. I guess to keep things legal, I better call that hypothetical. Okay. Hypothetical portfolio, 100K. And 250 were in a trading loaf and 250 are in a trending loaf, okay? So you can see this little metal stock here, same thing going on there. And here's another metal stock, or you can consider that this might be coal or energy, but another metal in mining at least. Uh, so again, this is the, the swing trade, the swing trade, the swing trade, the short-term pro profit, whatever you want to call that, because we don't know if the trend's going to go on forever. Sometimes what happens, you get triggered in, rallies up, then it dies. Well, if that's the worst thing ever happened to you, you'll own the world pretty soon, okay? Now, you can see this position is still on as a full position because both sides are highlighted. Now, luckily, right before the open, I'm sorry, right before I started the show, this thing came within two cents of the profit target. Now, two cents is close enough, okay? Close enough for government work. Because we're not looking to get rich on the first loaf of this. We're only looking for a 1% gain on the entire account, which comes to roughly $1,000. Sometimes you get a little bit more if you get a gap or the market moves sharply in your favor. And sometimes you get a little less if the market just barely kind of touches that profit target comes right back in before you can get out at it. But the point is that you don't want to split hair. So I'm kind of sneaking in a bit of a, a lesson on discretion here. When it comes this close, because we're hoping for this and above, and I know I just said the word hope, but if it comes that close, then you know it's close enough to exit on the first half of your shares because the real money is in the second loaf, okay? Now, let, let me answer some questions before we shift gears here. Okay, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning, Joe and Leon. Okay, Don says, when you have a market with significant amount of overhead supply that is very close as we have now, are you restrained in buying new longs? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Yes, you don't want to rush out and buy stocks in general, okay? You don't want to throw a dart. You want to be very, very selective. 
And again, you want to listen to the database. And what has the database lately told us what to, to, to do? Well, in a case like this, since we happen to have this chart up open, we had this kind of this double bottom. And by the way, uh, a double bottom, usually a market's going to fake you out. It's going to pretend to go to, or it's going to fake out to new lows, just like a double top in a market often will do this. It'll fake out to new highs or, and then implode, or it'll do this. It'll stall well short of its prior highs. It'll look like it's going there and then roll over. Again, a market will often do what it has to do to cause a lot of pain to a lot of people. So I like to see a double bottom like that, where it takes out the prior low a little bit, just enough to kind of wash out the last of whoever may be holding on. But when you see something come off the lows like this, make a bow tie, a first thrust, a kind of a cup and handle, all those other good things, a nice little kind of a quasi knockout move, kind of a micro TKO type of move. That's a good looking setup that's worth taking. So do you buy even though the market's questionable? Well, if you think you have a really good setup, then by all means. And in this particular case, it didn't hurt that this is an energy stock. And commodity stocks could trade contra to the overall market. Okay, so that's that's my question on that one. Is that um I think that answers it. Uh, looks like a rounding top to me, lower highs and lower lows. What do you think? Yeah, bars, we'll take a look at the market and uh, we'll get to the, but I, I agree. It still looks like we're kind of sideways at best in here. Robert says, the S&P headed to new highs or round the top bear market predictions. Correct. I don't know. Uh, and, and the other thing it could do, I mean, it, you know, we'll know when we see it. Okay. But right now I think we have to be prudent. So the question is, is it around the top? like I think, and it's going to continue lower, okay, or is it headed to new highs? I, right now, it looks like it's headed to new highs, okay? But I'm not going to rush out, and as soon as it crosses over to new highs, or if it crosses over to new highs, have you want to look at that, I'm not going to be a buyer right here. And the reason it is because this might just be the mother of all fakeouts. Now, you don't want to think too, too far ahead, but you do have to kind of think through some scenarios on how they would play out. This would be the worst thing that could happen for this market because that would cause the most amount of pain to the most people. Okay. It would suck in a lot of fresh longs. It would make a lot of old longs feel pretty good. And then it would spit them out if that happened. An even worse thing to happen would be since we've just kind of gone up for all intents and purposes to 2009, and then we got a little questionable in here. If this thing went up a lot higher, and again, this doesn't mean that we won't be buyers throughout this leg higher. We just have stops in place. We'll pick our spots carefully. We'll continue. Pick our spots carefully is what I tried to say. We'll continue to follow the what? The process, okay? We're not on and off, long or short or whatever. We're just kind of following the process. And if we get stopped out, we get stopped out. But the worst thing would happen if it did make significant new highs, then the most amount of people would obviously be on the wrong side of the market when it turned around or if it turned around like that. Okay. So we do, uh, we do get some letters here. And James says... I heard you talking about teaching psychology to beginning beginners. What do you teach them? How do you do it without prior prior knowledge of the charts or the market? So how do you teach psychology to a beginner without prior knowledge of the charts or the market? Well, that's an interesting statement. And as I wrote in the layman's guide to trading stocks, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. It's once you put real dollars on the line, then that psychology begins to rear its ugly head. Now, this is a slide that I originally put in a, I have a psychology course that I'm working on, but it's gonna be so massive that I had to put it aside and decided just to go back to the roots and do a beginner's course. But this is a slide I took from the, the, the more advanced course and put in beginner's course because it really tells the story and it's what James is asking. 
how do you teach psychology to someone without them already knowing the methodology? And it is a bit of a conundrum because it is a bit of a chicken and the egg type of situation. In other words, which came first? So until you trade a methodology, you don't know what your psychology will be, okay? And until you understand your psychology, it's going to be hard to trade a methodology. The good thing is, if you're doing all the things I would suggest in the beginner's course, such as trading at a small size, realizing that, by the way, realize there's some guy on the other side of every trade. So no matter how smart you are, whether it's a year from now or 20 years from now, and you've been at this, been working hard, there's still a guy on the other side of that trade that thinks he knows more than you. So you have to really play devil's advocate and say, what does he know that I don't know? So if you go back to the roots and remember that there's people behind the bars and what's their psychology – and you're able to read the emotion of others, read the emotions of others while keeping your own in check, then you'll do quite well. So based on James' comment, I think it's almost easier to start with a clean slate. I've had people who have emailed me for 10 years, almost 15 years, and, and about a, six months ago or a year ago, I forget when, I wrote a column and basically said, you know what, I'm cutting you off. Uh, and a few people actually cut off. Just I just have the emails go to junk now. I'm not being a jerk. It's just that obviously I'm not helping these people by by trying to help them. Okay, they they're gonna have to eventually help themselves. And I think that if you if you are struggling in trading, and this is this is the thing, it's like when I first was thinking about doing this beginner's course, I'm like, man, that's going to be kind of boring to, to write that. Uh, wouldn't it be more fun to, to, to make an advanced bow ties uh, or a linear regression and persistency course or something like that as opposed to a beginner's course? I said, well, it's a necessary evil. People need to know. Obviously, there's a gap. Even though I'm all about beginners and all about keeping it simple, there seems to be a gap. You know, you've got a, a, a stock selection course, which is fairly advanced, an IPO course, which is fairly advanced. And then you also have the trading service. Even though I spell everything out, you have to kind of get up to speed to understand what I'm doing. So I realize there's a gap in my products. And when someone recently, the aforementioned girl, was looking for – some guidance, even though my stuff's pretty basic, I really need something even more basic to point them to. So, again, I thought this would bore me to tears, but it's actually been kind of exciting for me to, to work on this course because in the back of my head, I'm thinking, what would happen if someone was successful for about 10 years and then all of a sudden started having problems? What would happen if they just came back to the beginning and back to the roots and realized there's people behind the trades and what do those other people do? And let's look at the charts from a perspective of what's the psychology of the other participants. And that's what's in the back of my mind the whole time. And that's how, although it's tricky and difficult because it is a chicken or the egg conundrum, I'm able to gently introduce the trading psychology. In fact, what's kind of kind of ironic is after before I got Jay's email for the last week before I got his email, I've been actually working on sneaking that trading psychology in to the beginning. You know, when I show like a little tick on a chart or whatever, I've been showing a little 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 stick figure, another stick figure, agreeing on a price to show that there's people that's actually behind these bars. And as Tom McClellan said, how you're forming a relationship with all these other people. So it's like I've slowly basically, ironically, started with understanding trading psychology before even getting into my first chart pattern. So sometimes you have to go back to the beginning, and T.S. Eliot said it best. And I've got this from John Bollinger, and he, he had a quote. He used to have a byline back when he had his professional. He had a forum for professionals, and 
oh, everybody started, you know, these, you have like these stupid forums, these email forums, and then the egos begin to rear their ugly head, especially with people in this business, and they started fighting it out, and you had to delete people and get people, it's the management of the list became too much, and John basically said, screw it, you know, you guys go off and do what you want to do, and uh, a lot of people went over to Tom McClellan's group afterwards, and I'm a member of that group, I just kind of lurk now, but that's, a, that's a, another story altogether. And that's where I get all the good stuff from Tom McClellan that you hear sometimes in these these uh, webinars. But I asked John, John used to have a byline, long story endless, huh? <laughs> that said uh, the true enlightenment is when you reach the beginning and you know that for the first time. And I've got a column where I expand upon this. So if you go look at the blogs, you can read it if you get a chance. And then he said, well, he, he he explained that he got it from uh, Albert Ayers. I forget the guy's exact name. It was a jazz musician documentary where he the, where the, this jazz musician had advanced so far. He came back in at the beginning, and I think that's kind of the 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 journey we go through, and we should not cease from exploration. And the end of all of exploring, we will arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And that's kind of in the back of my head. I don't want to get too esoteric on you. But that's kind of in the back of my head. It's like, how do you teach someone something without doing it? But having done it, it makes it a lot easier. So if they do struggle down the road, they can go back in and say, oh, yeah, it was right there. Dave warned that this would come. Dave warned that I have to be process oriented. Dave warned that there are other people out there I'm trading against and those people might screw me. Okay. Not enough of the players are behind bars. Yeah, I was wondering if that joke would come out. <laughs> I don't know who Corzine is, but uh, yeah, remember, I don't watch a whole lot of news. Okay. Carol says, I agree. So the psychology of the people in the market can affect the central bank intervention over, or overrun even that. Uh, that becomes, that's market manipulation. And the way you have to look at market manipulation is you you just have to trade what is. So central banks and governments are manipulating this market higher. So again, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is is. So don't get too caught up in confusing the issue with facts. Now, in the back of my mind, you got to realize that manipulation does not work longer term. Nobody can manipulate a market longer term. So just realize that sooner or later that market manipulation will end badly. I remember years ago, as I said quite a bit, used to beg the Fed to do something and they'd barely throw you a crumb and then the markets would just skyrocket and take off. And as my good friend Rob Hanna has pointed out, it's been like a drug with the markets where the Fed all of a sudden instead of being fiscally responsible, just turned around and realized that, hey, we're just going to step on the gas and keep the markets going as long as we can. It's like they lost all credibility, as far as I'm concerned. And as Rob Hanna pointed out, it used to just take a little bit to get going. It's kind of like a drug. It just takes a little bit to get going at first. But eventually... It takes more and more and more, and he's backed it up. Rob's really good at backing things up with statistics. And he showed how each dumping of money into the market, so this was a, a year or two ago, so it's still happening. This is something that's macroeconomic. might take a long time to unfold. But each dumping of, the, of money in the market has taken more and more and more to get the market higher. So it's a very incremental increase. And... My feeling is like years ago, the Fed didn't do anything and maybe did a little bit here and there, and that was able to, to push the market around or, or get the market moving. So I don't know. I think the Fed needs to back off. Central banks need to back off and stop all the manipulation. Uh, I, you know, I guess that there are times when you need stability in the market, and maybe that's why they exist. Uh, I, mean, I don't know. That's a conversation for another day. But – as usual, what it is, is um, I do have uh, my trading service out there. This is kind of hidden, but if you go look, uh, if you go to this link on my website and uh, maybe in the YouTube video, I'll put a um, 
once I get the recording out there, I'll, I'll make a link in this for an annotation. Uh, but if you do go to getting started on my website, you could get, uh, you could find a link for this too. And you can see everything that's, uh, that's happening. It, it does have a delay to it, obviously for, um, respect for those who are paying. So you can check that out. And it's a good way to, uh, it's a good way to learn. Someday I might el eliminate the, um, the trial rate simply because you can follow along delayed as long as you want or until I run out of uh, bandwidth or whatever it, it begins to cost me. Then I'll start kicking people off. But uh, for now, it looks like I have enough room for that. So what's up? Uh, I'm still working on my new improved website and I'm running a fast track special uh, until I, I forget what I said, 10 of these. I'm going to sell 10 of these between now and in May. So if you go to uh, under Fast Track and scroll down, you can get a little more information on this. And uh, I've been podcasting also. And you get to podcast on YouTube, iTunes, and other places. Okay. And again, you can always email me if you have uh, questions. And if you go to um, My website under free reports, which is under, I think, getting started on one of those, you can get a 21-page report on what I'm doing here, and that'll help you out. This is my YouTube channel, and if you go, if you want to subscribe, I think it's YouTube slash Dave Landry uh, dot D-O-T C-O-M, Dave Landry dot com. All right, let's uh, bump out, uh, crank out some of these questions. And then um, we'll get do do you have chart up? Okay, Robert, we'll get to those. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and open it up to individual uh, stocks, and we'll take a look at the overall market and all. Uh, please, if you don't mind, just put one stock uh, per um, per line and hit return. And the reason I ask you to do that is is for your benefit because. If 15 people are asking about stocks and one person's asking about 10 in a row, um, I'll just pick I'll pick and choose from those. If you want all of them answered, just uh, one at a time. Let's take a look uh, at a couple things here. Let's take a look at the overall market. I do want to point out a few things. So here's the S&P 500. Obviously, we've headed higher. For a long, long time, or intermediate term, I guess. And it's been a pretty serious run. So you can't argue with the fact that the market has gone up. Again, what is is. But as Don was pointing out, now we're at a crucial juncture because we have some overhead supply to deal with. Now, maybe some of that was washed out here, but you still have this overhead supply. And we have no way of knowing how much got washed out of the system here. So it's not as important as, as if we didn't have this here. If we didn't have this here, this would be more important is what I'm trying to say. But nonetheless, in addition to that weekly signal, sell signal that's still in effect, I think the market still looks questionable. And again, even if you didn't know anything, you could say, let's just draw a line going back in time. And you can go all the way back to 2015. So that, at the least, that arrow points sideways. And yeah, we've got a pretty good longer term trend in place. But that trend began to slow at the end of 2015, and then now the market is going mostly sideways. Okay? Doesn't mean it's the end of the road, but it means you want to be cautious. NASDAQ, lots of overhead supply, like the S&P 500. And again, like I said earlier, these V-shaped recoveries at high levels are pretty tough because, because it's hard to mount a new leg. If I can get it to draw, it might not draw on top of an old one. Let's take a look at the Russell 2000. It's kind of interesting in the Russell on a micro basis. It was kind of off to the races a couple days ago, and I guess it's having an okay day now. It kind of stalled out a little bit yesterday. But even with that massive rally, we're only where we were a few weeks ago. And if you back the chart way out, and let's just take a look at a weekly here, a little bit more obvious on a weekly. You can see that pretty serious slides been in place so far. And so far, it's just kind of pulled back. Even if you didn't know anything about markets, take a high, connect it to the lowest low, 
take the lowest low, connect it to the recent high, and that'll tell you a lot right there. That's that's what looks like a pullback to me. And what's on top of that pullback? A lot. So the Russell 2000, 2000 stocks, that's the general market. So that tells me that the overall market still might be in trouble. And as I said earlier, if we take a look at these Bardic Star Industry Groups, and we sort them by, let's do a, um, let's sort them by 52-week high. So if we go price as a percent of 52-week high, we're going to notice that pretty high in this list is going to be what? Uh, well, debt, okay? Debt, food, cigarettes, tobacco, utilities. Now, again, retail looking pretty good in here, but retail also very dangerous V-shaped recovery. But for the most part, a lot of foods, real estate, utilities, non-durables, REITs, which is also real estate, obviously. So not a whole lot to get excited about as far as the new highs or concern. So the makeup of this market, again, is mostly, the rally, I should say, is mostly defensive areas. Now, coming off of low areas, and we're long the energies and metals and mining because we like them, because they've been rallying nicely off the lows, a little bit of overhead to deal with, but we take things on a case-by-case -case basis, and so far, so good. AROC being one of those, oil service, okay? And you can see it shot up close to that initial private target this morning before coming back in. So we're long some of these stocks. And not much else because that's they look good. They're coming off of major lows. And I think they have a lot more potential coming off these major, major lows than something like retail, which is already way up here and having a V-shaped recovery. So, again, the lesson of today or one of the lessons, I should say, hopefully you're getting something out of this, is that a V-shaped recovery at low levels is a lot more powerful than one at high levels. Okay, uh, Corzine borrowed eight billion of client money at MF Global to short European sovereign debt. <laughs> All right, not a good idea, huh? Something at the back of the beginning. Empty your mind, grasshopper from Kung Fu. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes you just kind of have to forget about all you know and just go back to the roots. Go back to, the, like uh, Imagine Dragon says, you know, go back to the roots. <laughs> Another high, another low. And sometimes it's very important. Craig says, what are they, Fed, going to do now if there's a problem, LOL? They would have one choice right now. What would that one choice be? Yeah, I mean, that's the problem is, is what do you do now? <laughs> Lower rates to negative one? You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, what do you do? And then... God forbid, people always forget, you could have deflation. I was talking with a few people um, at Traders Expo about that just a few weeks back in New York. You know, what if we do have the deflation? That would be pretty scary. All right, Karen says, John Bollinger's quote is, if you advance far enough, you arrive at the beginning. Thank you, Karen. Karen used to be in that uh, forum, I think. If you advance far enough, you arrive at the beginning. And and that's kind of, I know it sounds a little egotistical, but that's kind of where I am with, with this with this beginner's course. So that's what's kind of fun about it is I feel like kind of getting back to the roots, getting back to the beginning. It's like, okay, how do I simplify all this experience and bring it back to some to a level where someone could understand it? And then at least understand enough of it to when they get the experience of like, oh, Okay, that, that makes a lot more sense now. We shall now cease from we shall now cease from adding indicators, and in the end of all our indicators, we'll arrive to a place where the <laughs> will be the will be to arrive at the price chart, and we will know it for the first time. Yeah, I need a, I, I need a kind of that's a good idea, uh, Ray. I need a, um, I, I do. Some of you may have seen the presentation. I do this one mostly in person, but I haven't done it in a while. But I'll take a blank chart and I'll start adding indicators to it until you can no longer see the chart. And then I'll start peeling them off until you get back to the chart. And it's kind of like the same sort of type of mentality is you got to get back to the beginning on some of this stuff sometimes. 
S&P has opened gap at 1870. Do you have any thoughts on the gap being filled? Uh, don't, folk, gaps don't always get filled, okay? So don't make that, don't get too excited about that, okay? Let's see if this is, um, it's hard to get, I don't know how you get a gap in the, um, in the cash because the cash doesn't always uh, have a true open to it. Um, that's why candles don't work for those candle people with the S&P 500. Um, I guess you do have some gaps in here. You're saying 1870. I don't see it. Um, are you in futures? Maybe in futures is a little more obvious. Um, I, you know, don't, I see gaps as, as resistance more than anything. Uh, I wouldn't rush out and say, Oh, you know, it's, Oh, it's a window as they call them. You know, it's going to get closed. No. John says, this is just a sincere. Thanks. You are the best, Dave. Oh, thank you, John. Appreciate that. Might quote you on that if you don't mind. Okay. But the database is you. Otherwise quantifiable, otherwise not quantifiable to us. Okay. Angela is saying that the database is me, which is not quantifiable to you. Well, it is if you study it. It is, and, and I don't want to soft sell here, but I guess maybe now is a good time to soft sell. It is if you take the stock selection course. It is if you take the IPO course, so you know what I'm seeing. But even if you don't do all that, which I recommend you do because I think it will pay for itself. Even if you don't do all that, then when you look at your tradable universe, you could do a few things. In fact, you could look at all stocks if you want. But if you look at your tradable universe, you could come in here and let's say if we sorted by, you could first off, you could sort it by new highs. Price is a percent of 52-week highs. Okay? And then you could say, well, what is showing up in here? Okay? Well, General Mills, what's that? A food. Okay? SHV, what's that? A bond, okay? So BIL, what's that? That's a bond. PepsiCo, what's that? A food, okay? XLP, what's that? Consumer non-durables. So you can come in here and see what's at the top of the list, okay? There's an energy stock. I'm sorry, electric, uh, utility stock. Uh, Black Hills, I think, is a utility uh, some sort of emerging bonds, some kind of bonds fund in here. So you can first thing you do, you can look at the new high list and see where the new highs are. The next thing you could do is you could sort them by volatility and you could start going through them every day. Okay, now way up here, you're going to have quite a few that are just kind of um, irrelevant. But once you get a little further down, you could say, okay, what am I seeing? Oh, energy stock. Energy stock, energy stock, energy stock, okay? Energy stock, energy stock, energy stock, energy stock, energy stock, energy stock, metal stock, okay? So what is the database saying? What is the database saying, okay? Database saying energy stocks, okay? Donnie think vacuum. <laughs> About one in 10,000 of you will get that. Google it. Donnie think vacuum, chicken pot pie. All right, so what does it say? What's the database saying? Well, you can listen to Dave, which will help you read the database, and I'd love for you to be on the service. But if you do want to do it yourself, and by the way, do it yourself and hire me. You can do both, okay? It's not a mutually exclusive decision. But even though the database is Dave reading the database, you too can read the database, okay? And my best Bella voice, you could do it. So yeah, it's not it's not as elusive as you might think. I'm not sure. Karen says, "What do you mean?" I think that was to another thing, or is it? Okay, gotcha. All right, drove my point home. All right, Aaron says, "A Rock Profit Target did trigger. Wish I could watch this stuff, but I'm not able to." Well, you could. Aaron Aaron's on the service, and he's saying that, "Hey, you know, we got close to the Profit Target. Yay!" And then pfft, it came back in. Well, first of all, that's why we take profits. Now, assuming that it actually hit the profit target is why we take profits. But you could set an alarm near the profit target. We all have smartphones now and set an alarm near the profit target 
and get out. Years ago, I had a beeper that I kept in my pocket, and I was actually the first client. I forget what the name of the company was, but they would send out. I would uh, fax. I think I had to fax in my alerts. Fax. Can you believe that? Those of you who don't know what that is, this thing that uh, I've got a broken one sitting on my desk. I need to get another one for the last two people in the world still use them. But you put a piece of paper in it, and it scans in it, and it sends it off over telephone wires, and then it prints out somewhere else in the world. But this little – I had a little – you guys are lucky now they start now. you got a smartphone. Just have an alert sent to you, okay? You get a little buzz in your pocket, and then uh, go off, make a trade, come back to work. So what I would have, I had a little pager in my pocket, and one of the guys kind of nosy at work saw it. He's like, only people have pagers are doctors and drug dealers. Which one are you? I don't see no stethoscope. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I was carrying around a pager, and uh, it would give me an alert whenever a stock was at a certain level, and I knew I had to take action. So I did, I did have the luxury of watching the market all day at that particular job. So I had a, 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 a pager. But nowadays, you don't need a pager. So set an alarm, have an alarm go to your, your uh, smartphone. So, you know, okay, I'm, I'm you know, the AROC is above eight. Is that enough money for me to take partial profits? Do I should I take some action? Maybe I have a chance here. I could take a break, watch the chart a little bit, and close enough for government work, okay? And if you look at like a, like a one-minute chart, not that you want to stare at a one-minute chart all day, but you could see that with the profit target was what, like 820, okay? You could see that it came pretty close and stayed around this 8-ish level for a while. So you could have gotten off the hook. Now, in the service, I'm going to not count that as hitting that partial profit because it didn't actually hit the partial profit. I track things mechanically to keep things simple. But in reality, and this is why I don't like to put out actual results, because in reality, you should be taking partial profits when it's getting close like that. And I usually warn ahead of time the night before, hey, guys, hint, hint, we're getting close to this partial profit target. So, yeah, just make sure you have a um, – <laughs> put a pager in your pocket. Here we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I could get in a lot of trouble if I if I start elaborating some of those stories. Uh, okay, uh, I think that pretty much sums up markets and all. Let's uh, let's let's hop into these individual stocks. O L E D. You want a possible entry for it? Well, first of all, this is not this is kind of an electrocardiogram in here. Uh, so that would not be a stock I would be trading anyway. So what I would recommend you do is find something that looks a little better. Now, I realize that you don't always um, – let's see what comes up here. You don't want to trade stocks that look like electrocardiograms. An electrocardiogram is, you know, beep, 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 beep. So you don't want that. So if you didn't know anything about trading, you would draw a line from where it is now going back in time and then make your arrow. So there's nothing to buy there. So that, there's no entry point on that. Um, you want to find stocks. We've talked, you know, kind of beat the dead horse in this A-Rock. But that's, you want to find stocks that have at least, now this is a transitional pattern. So it's a little tougher. But you can see that at least it was headed higher in a very solid manner coming off of lows. Let me see if I can find a better one. Well, it's not a whole – the transitional pattern is a little bit tougher to teach. But if you're trying to look – if you're looking at a stock in general at higher levels, then OLED would not be one of them. I'm not trying to pick on you, okay? It just doesn't fit the methodology. And that's the, the main thing is that we want to find stocks that are trending and fit the methodology. All right, Travis wants to talk about – buddy Travis. How you doing, Travis? DB. All right. Thank you, Travis. There's a picture of Travis on the front of my website. At least it used to be. It's on their testimonials now. Okay. Uh, what do you want to do with this? You want to buy it? These foreign um, – some of these foreign stocks have been setting up in here, but this is no longer set up because notice that it rallied up, and now it's beginning to come back in. I'm not so worried about the gaps in here, but it's coming back in. It looks like it wants to come down here to its old lows. So I would ignore this one. It's not a long or a short 
but it's just not a trade at all. RJ wants to talk about Cousins. C Z Z. Now that's going to be what a food, okay? And it has worked its way nicely higher. But sometimes you have to see the forest for the trees. So let's look at the trees. Trees look pretty good. This is a pretty nice persistent trend. Now, who was asking me earlier about the stock that looks like electrocardiogram? This stock does not look like electrocardiogram. It has a very nice persistent trend higher. In fact, if I was just seeing this stock, I would say, let's wait for a pullback and let's be all over it. Unfortunately, when you back out the chart, you can see that you've got a lot of overhead supply to overcome. Now, if you're taking a swing trade from here to here, that's a pretty big move. But ideally, you want to get into a stock that doesn't have much overhead supply. You don't want to cap your gains, okay? All right, Robert wants to know about NHTC. He's been waiting patiently. Thank you, Robert, for waiting. Uh, no, electric cardiogram, okay? Um, you know, would you buy the stock? Would you sell the stock? I don't know. It's kind of all over the place. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's a Jackie Mason stock. Now, a while back, it looked like it was in trouble back here, but now it's just all over the place. So I would leave that one alone, Robert. NAII, NAII. Sorry to make you retype all those symbols. Uh, now, this is kind of interesting in that it's breaking out to new highs. It's a little bit all over the place, but maybe if it continues to break out on a pullback, the only thing that I would be very concerned about is it's very thin. So it's 60,000 shares. Let's say you bought, I don't know, just pull a number out the air, 1,000 shares. What's 1,000 divided by 60,000? You're going to be 1.6% if I did my math right of the volume in this stock. So that's kind of dangerous. Um, so it's kind of thin. As a private trader, you can take some of these thin stocks, but just realize this that's for some that you want to be more advanced in your trading before you start. You want to be more successful in the smallish cap stocks before you take micro cap stocks. Okay. Uh, MRO looks okay. Uh, what I like about it is it's probably a bow tie. Yeah, it was. It, it, it kind of triggered back here already. I think I would pass. Uh, let's get back to a regular chart if I can find one. My keys are messed up. I think I would pass to the fact that it's kind of going sideways shorter term. And then you have uh, a fair amount of overhead supply to deal with in this particular issue. And sometimes it's hard to find stocks at low levels that don't have overhead supply. Tree? Uh-oh. Fat finger something. Talk amongst yourselves. Let me get that back up. Okay, Aaron said only two. Yeah, it was only two it was it was only two cents from the profit target, and that's close enough for government work. And I know if you don't luxury watch the screen all day, sometimes you 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 might have to be willing to let a couple of these things go. I actually don't recommend that you watch a screen all day. I would much rather you see, um, you know, keep a loose eye on it here and there and then set an alarm. If you have to. Okay. Jerry says, you beat me up on BWXT. Yeah, I did. Okay. And the reason I beat you up on that one was because you were obsessed with it. And it did a lot of things that weren't great, okay? Uh, first of all, you don't want to try to be getting in a stock after it's just, if it's just barely bumping up against its old highs in here. It also, right here, lost momentum. Now, if you were buying willy-nilly, and in this particular case, it worked, but the market could be a really bad teacher. So it didn't fit the methodology. Uh, it's not by way or highway, but that's why I beat you up on that. Because it was losing, it actually was kind of losing a little momentum in here. And then it wasn't actually set up. And then for it to set up, for me, it would have to really clear this range and then pull back and look like this. And again, it's kind of that V-shaped recovery to some extent at high levels. And so far, it hasn't really taken off. So I just didn't like it. And there's 2,000 other stocks. And the reason to beat you up is because 
You emailed me and I said, I didn't like it. Then you emailed me again and said, I still don't like it. Then you emailed me again and said, but Dave, it's going up. And I'm like, okay, but I still don't like it. <laughs> so that's why I beat you up. Sometimes the market could be a bad teacher. And the worst thing happened is the worst thing that happened is that you become successful in these and then you start buying them. Okay. Ray says, I bought CZZ earlier and now have a free trade. Should I wait till the market takes me out at a trailing stop or should I just get out when it hits resistance and my money somewhere else? Put my money somewhere else. Well, Ray, what's your plan? Okay. Your plan is your plan. Follow your plan. And if you're asking me, what I would do is if you're already in it and you already have a quote unquote free position, then trail your stop higher and maybe. Maybe you can get through that resistance. Keep in mind that when I go into a trade, or when you go into a trade, I should say, too, you want to look for perfection, okay? But realize as soon as you pull the trigger and get in that trade, the market conditions will change, and you may no longer have that perfection. So I would follow whatever your original plan was. If your original plan is to do what I like to do, get in for a swing trade and hold on as long as you can for hopefully a longer-term trade, especially once you've gotten your profit target out and once the initial profit target and once you have that trailing stop in place, then by all means stick with the position, see it to its fruition. As I wrote about a few weeks ago, see each position to its fruition. Aaron, by the way, what are you doing at this show if you're at work? <laughs> so why could you, why could you pull the screen? All right, five for uh, no comment. <laughs> I don't know your boss, so don't worry about that. Uh, five looks a little wide and loose to me, okay? Now, keep in mind that personalities of stocks can change. So if this stock starts really trending nicely and starts shaping up, then I'm not going to worry about its old personality. But based on its old personality, it still looks like it's kind of all over the place. So I don't know. Maybe if it continues higher, maybe I'll pull back. But right now, I think it's too much of electrocardiogram. How much does HMY need to pull back for Travis? I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, this stock has become a bit of a almost a bottle rocket. It's going up. What percentage is that? Let's see if we can get this screen to work. It's going up 500% of a short period of time. I think I would leave this one alone now based on the magnitude of that move, but it would have to retrace significantly. I mean, it could, it could drop down to below three, maybe even two and a half. And this transition still might be intact, but it's just so dangerous at this juncture to trade after a 500% run. So I would, um, I think I would pass on that. You're welcome, Travis. Uh, what about ACAD? No, I haven't looked at it. Okay. Do you? ACAD used to be AutoCAD. Uh, la la la. It's pretty serious volume. Um, it looks like it's trying to turn a corner in here, but it's got a mountain of overhead supply. So I would leave that one alone. Oh, no worries. Uh, you could ask him. Don't worry. He's worried that I might have already covered it. No, no, no worries. A L D R for Otis. Uh, this looks okay. Um, I prefer it if it was coming off of all-time lows in here, like way back here. But it looks okay. It's still a fairly new issue. Ah, you know what? Now I'm beginning to pick it apart a little bit, though. Too much overhead supply. Also, this whole move higher is just on this gap in this one bar here. So at first glance, it kind of caught my eye. But then after a little more analysis, too much overhead supply. Your whole move is just one gap and one bar up. So I think I would pass on that one. All right, Susan, take care. Good seeing you again. Sweet dreams. Haha. -ha. Okay, we've got a couple of questions on that. What are you short, uh, Travis? Deutsche Bank. <laughs> DB, Deutsche, Deutsche Bank, sucking balls, kid. It go to zero. <laughs> Love you a long time. Um, it could do whatever it wants. It's actually kind of improving as of late. Let's see what it looks like longer term. Let's take a look at a weekly. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it could do whatever it wants. And certainly, from a longer-term perspective, it sure doesn't look good. Uh, it did look like it was trying to turn the corner not too long ago, but I, I would definitely pass. If you're short, stay short. Stay short forever. Why not? LSG, that's going to be a mining company, I think. Lakeshore Goal. Yeah, a little bit more pullback, but that looks pretty good. Um, it sort of accelerated higher a little bit in here, but it needs to pull back a little more. Okay. GPL, this could be Panther, right? That's going to be another. That's going to be a silver company, maybe. Yeah, great Panther silver. Uh, same as the other one. In fact, this one looks a little cleaner. Now, it is a bit of a penny stock, so keep that in mind. But, yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, but it's going to require a little bit deeper pullback. It does have some issues, but that's way back here. And it, it was a little wide and loose, but it's a commodity-related stock. So some of the things I preach about. You could be a little bit more lenient. XLE is going to be an ETF that's going to be related to energies. And there it is. Uh, a little bit of overhead supply here, but you can see it's kind of worked its way higher. I think it's turned a corner. I wouldn't rush out and buy it at this juncture. I think I would look for uh, possibilities in individual stocks. You're short at 1819, 890, 1890? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what got you short there, but I hear you. Um, yeah, stay short. You know, put a stop in at some place where it looks like it's uh, obviously turned a corner on you. All right, Aaron, you're going to get that page in your pocket. Good, 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 good. Hey, Dave, look at IBB right now. It's the only time since 2016 it has been above its 200-day moving average. It's 50-day SMA. 50-day EMA. Well, let's add an SMA to that. Let's see what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, but... If that's your if that's your methodology is you buy when it goes above the moving average and sell when it goes below, uh, I think you get whipsawed a lot. But then if that's what you do, then that's what you should do. Um, just like um, salt and pepper pushing it, you know, it's what you do. I can't come up with a better analogy. Uh, but what I would do if you really wanted to buy it, I would maybe wait for a bow tie or something. Something that's got a little bit more confirmation, like you got a 10-day sample, a 30-day exponential, a 20-day exponential, and they're all beginning to shift. So you have a much more major sell signal in place other than just kind of peeping up a, above a longer-term moving average. In a case like the 50-day moving average, um, this could just be a catch-up effect. I mean, because this is because you go back 50 days in time, which I don't know where that is. I don't have time to count them. But that's just a drop-off effect. So just because it's above the 50-day moving average doesn't mean that it's necessarily doing great. It just means that the older bad high, well, the older higher level data is coming off, and the newer lower level data is is coming in. Okay, so it's just it's pulling the moving average down due to the drop-off effect. So I wouldn't necessarily say that that's a great thing just yet, okay? Oh, do I like XLE if it's a trend follow alongside? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. Well, not yet on a weekly. Uh, it hadn't turned a corner on the weekly. Uh, XLE, it's still in a downtrend. On a daily chart, it's turned a corner. See, so you kind of got a bow tie in here. And keep in mind, if I'm trading a transitional pattern, I don't want to sit around and wait for a weekly signal. But Dave, you talk about weekly signals. Well, that's because the weekly signal sometimes eventually shows up. Like in the SP 500, the weekly signal eventually showed up. I used to be on a, a webcast that, that I don't think it exists anymore, at least not in its original form. And they would all they, their favorite thing to do was pull up weekly bow ties. And uh, you know, my point was always that, yeah, you, you could catch really, really major turns on a weekly, but let's look at the daily first. So weekly basis, still in a downtrend. And keep in mind with a transitional pattern, you are a bit of a pioneer. You're still fighting that longer term downtrend or longer term uptrend on the short side. But the beauty is, as a pioneer, you might get the gold, okay? AG for Andre, that's going to be... My buddy Andre up in New York. Uh, longer term, now I know it's a few years back. You got a mountain of overhead supply. I would try to find a little silver stock that didn't have as much overhead supply. But I hear you. If it pulls back in here, 
it, it might be worth a trade because it does look like the motherball bottoms is in place here. Jim, I'm not going to like Walmart. I'll tell you why. It's too thick usually to trade. Walmart is a big, thick stock. If you take a look at the volatility on it, it's got a volatility of 19. What's the uh, spiders right now? Anybody know top of the head? 17. So it's kind of in line with the overall market. Uh, it trades a bazillion shares every day. And then it's just kind of creep tire in here. It's just, it's just not a stock that's good to trade. The only, the only time you could trade something like a Walmart or a big thick stock is possibly on a short side because it's priced for perfection. Donald wants to talk about OIL. I normally look at USO. I'm not a big fan of ETNs because they're a little sketchy. But yeah, I think uh, I think it's sort of turned a corner, but now it looks like it's still bottoming. Maybe it's going to come down and do a double bottom. What's USO doing? Something similar. Uh, I think it's bottoming. I don't know if it's bottomed out yet, but the oil stocks sure think that it has. Okay, it's hard to make money in an overall commodity like this, overall ETN or ETF. Better off in individual issues, but I think it's bottoming. But yeah, it certainly lost some momentum as of late. I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. AVXS long on light volume, new issue light volume, half a billion cap. AVXS. Um, yeah, it's a little light. Uh, this is one we were working with somebody on this one recently. Um, it looks okay. I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to new, new issues. Um, I hear you on the volume. It looks okay. It's not jumping out at me as the best setup in the world. But it looks okay. I guess my only problem is it's sort of, it, it kind of pulled back below where it kind of broke out from. I would wait for a more solid rally in this one and then look to play a pullback. It's kind of all over the place a little bit. I hear you, though. Okay, Greg says, thanks. True enough. Donald says, thanks. You're welcome. VRX for bars. VRX. Uh, no. I know people who are veterans of the show are like, uh-oh. <laughs> Here it comes. What is wrong with my charts? Here we go. Uh, no. Um, you want to buy this? Draw your arrow, okay? It looks like it's going down. So, yeah, you wouldn't want to buy that. You know, this is where a beginner's course would come into play. If you've been out there trading already and you're trading momentum, and if you're here asking about a stock, then I guess you're trading not to beat you up bars, but as an example, it's, it's a good example, that this is not something that you'd want to be buying, okay? If you're already short, then stay short by all means, unless you want to short it. Uh, but even that, um, I would avoid it. Short it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sure. yeah. Uh, I wouldn't short it now because it's kind of bottomed out in here. And it's also, um, it's just so long into the trend. It's probably still in trouble. I'd much rather catch a short a little bit earlier. Uh, what's the OZRK would be a good a good, good example maybe. Uh, if you back the chart way out on OZRK, like a weekly chart, you can see it's at these very high levels, Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, Bars. I didn't mean to beat you up. I didn't realize that you were uh, one to short that. Okay. Good example, though, <laughs> for everybody else here. Um, and this is one, I forget where we got in or what was the, what was the pattern. It might have been a bow tie or a first thrust. I think it was back here somewhere, kind of in the early stages of the rollover, as opposed to um, like that, that other one that was way down at multi year lows. Want to short it, not buy it. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Michael Lewitt, I don't know who that is, called out VRX back when it was at 165. He also called out DB. VRX sucks balls, too. <laughs> Travis, you got an attitude today, man. <laughs> GLD, that's going to be gold. Gold looks good still. Um, it's a little wide and loose and choppy in here. We do have this little gap down, but that's okay. It's a commodity. You have a bow tie coming off of multi-year lows. Look at this, okay? So uh, I think gold, I'm still a bull on gold. Uh, the gold stocks have been tough to get into, okay? But I'm still a bull on them, and I still think the gold is worthwhile. Um, 
I wouldn't focus so much on the underlying commodity unless you wanted to. Um, but the reason I wouldn't is because your 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 HV is 20. It's going to be a lot harder to get a, a substantial move out of it. LMAO. <laughs> Duluth I like. Uh, DLTH, that's been on my watch list. Um, it's not the most perfect stock in the world. It is a clothing company. It's not that exciting, but it is an IPO. Uh, the only problem is it really didn't get too far past this uh, recent little high in here, but it looks it looks okay. I think it's I think it belongs on a momentum list. Okay, Howard says VRX gamblers think profits, traders think risk. That's a good point. I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> what was that movie? One time I crashed my boat to the dock, and some guy at the dock, redneck, all drunk. I'll buy that boat for a dollar. <laughs> What movie was that? That was an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, I think. That was a bad movie. A bad Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. I guess that kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, but keeping an eye on this one, too. This is uh, an IPO. One thing with IPOs that I talked about in the course is when they have this huge, wide-range opening bar, I tend to ignore them until they can take it out. So, yeah, this needs to go on your radar now. Otis says, I'm stuck at Nike at 65. Should I sell? Well. Otis, what was your original plan, okay? And if you didn't originally have one, that's fine. My advice to someone who's stuck in a position who obviously doesn't like the position is to put a stop in somewhere and go about your life and forget about it, maybe even a hard stop. Then that way, if the market stops you out, so what, okay? If the stock takes off, then you're still in. Because what happens is if you don't have a plan and you just say, well, the hell what I'm going to get out, what's going to happen next? The market's going to take off without you, okay? But if you don't have a plan and you just hold on, hold on, hold on, what happens? You, you lose a lot of money. So from a psychological standpoint, I think letting the market make decisions for you, making them passive decisions as opposed to active ones, is a good thing to do so i would just put a stop in somewhere and if you could stop that so be it uh we're uh we're out of time so i, I geez i know I, I feel bad we have so many people that are asking for um uh setups so where would you put the stop i you know i don't know you'll have to make a decision on that um i mean it's so wide and loose you, you'd have to give it at least several points in here um, I don't know, maybe – see, it's a stock that I wouldn't want to be in to begin with. So, I mean, that's that's the two things to look at. Could you sell it? Could you get out and be okay and just take your loss, take your lumps and move on? And if you can't, then then put a stop somewhere in there, maybe a few points below where the market is and let the market take you out. Anyway, I'm going to wrap things up. Anything unanswered, you can shoot me an email on or bring it to next uh, chart show. Uh, I, I appreciate everybody being here Uh what a great bunch today. I think we set another record. So thank you so much. Uh, everyone have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again and again, shoot me an email if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome.